want you to give me Stan at his at his best when he's really upset about something and he's and he's giving it to you guys, okay? <laughs> or 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 anything that he might say that you guys will kind of laugh at later on. All right, here you go. It's all you. It's all you. Everything he said. <laughs> go, run, move. Ah! What are those guys doing out there? It's just they don't want to play defense. They don't want to run back. And it's just ah. Uh. Ever get on you? Dwight, what are you doing? You're not doing anything out there. Block a shot. Get a rebound. Ah. Uh. What's going on, everyone? It is the Ball Don't Lie podcast here on Penn State Sports Night. We may be going virtual now uh, in terms of Penn State classes, but that does not mean the podcast stops because there's a lot going on. The NBA free agency, we are right in the thick of it. And the season is shortly approaching. I believe training camp starts on December 6th. Preseason starts on December 11th. And just moments before we start recording this, the NBA released the opening night game that's going to be the Warriors taking on the Nets. Uh, it's going to be Kevin Durant's first game with the team and, of course, against his former team in the Warriors. And the battle for L.A. kicks off game one, Lakers versus Clippers. Montrez Harrell, maybe there's some bad blood there with the Clippers after he hopped uh, hopped over the fence and uh, went to the Lakers. So, Matt, what, what was your opinion on these games? What are you looking forward to? Well, I'm really looking forward to the Warriors-Nets game because, as you said, uh, Kevin Durant, his first game in Nets uniform going to be against uh, the team he previously played for in the Golden State Warriors. Uh, I think he's still buddies with Steph Curry and Steve Kerr and all that, so it should be interesting to see that. And as far as Lakers-Clippers goes, whenever the NBA needs a, uh, needs a big game, they always turn to Lakers-Clippers. So it uh, should be a fun opening night. Yeah, they really do. It's always like, oh, uh, Lakers-Clippers. Um, yeah. But <laughs> so that's a very good point, Matt. Um, yeah, starting with the Nets Warriors, I am interested to see that game. Both teams look really, really different this season. Uh, the looking at the Warriors, they're gonna presumably have Steph Curry, hopefully healthy for them. They got some new pieces there, and like Kelly Oubre. I don't, I think Wiggins and Steph Curry played one game together. Uh, James Wiseman, of course, is probably gonna be a big player right out the get go, uh, second overall pick. So their team is definitely gonna look a lot different. I imagine they'll be better. I mean, I did go on a rant saying how they're not gonna make the playoffs, but. Uh, they'll definitely at least be better. They won't be the worst team in the NBA this season. And the, the Nets, that's a team we're, we're going to talk about them a lot later in this podcast, but they are very interesting because they are the, the boomer bust title contenders here. They got Kevin Durant back. They get Kyrie Irving back. And who knows where how good this team's going to be. Yeah, the, there's a lot of question marks there with Brooklyn, but uh, we'll get into that later. Yeah, and of course, uh, Bow for LA, Montrez Harrell. Uh, uh, it could be a little intense there. He's an intense guy. The Clippers, there's definitely some bad blood between those two teams. Uh, but definitely looking forward to it. The NBA does a lot better job scheduling uh, primetime games than the NFL does. I'll just say that. Oh, ton better. <laughs> Let's not even get into those Thursday night games. We got we got Broncos Chiefs this Sunday night. Should be a <laughs> should be a fun one, man. Thanks. Hopefully, Denver has a quarterback starting this week. Uh, but. Um, <laughs> Of course, you know, we really wanted to bump out some content. This is actually our 30th episode of Ball Don't Lie, our 20th together, Matt. Uh, so I'm glad the hey. podcast – yeah, I'm glad it's had longevity a little bit. Um, so thankful for that, and uh, thankful we can still do it. And, uh, of course, we're going to be previewing a lot of different teams today, Matt. So give the fans what they want. What is the slogan here? Slogan? Oh, no team left behind, baby. Thank you. All right. Yeah, maybe no I should left use a different word. Uh, <laughs> in the rundown, Matt, I was hoping you were looking at it. Uh, yeah. But we're going to start off previewing the Atlantic Division. It might be one of the most stacked divisions uh, across the association. We're going to start off. We're going to start from team that came in first to team that came in last. You know, the standings may be different, but that's kind of how we're going to base it here. So we're going to start off with the Toronto Raptors previewing them. So, an interesting offseason. Uh, we were saying that Fred Van Vliet was going to sign a max deal with the New York Knicks. Um, he was someone who said he really wanted to get paid a lot of money, and he did, but maybe not as much as people thought. He signed for a four-year, $85 million extension to stay with the Raptors, Matt. Um, that sounds like a, a bit of a bargain for Fred Van Vliet, a guy who got a finals MVP vote from Hubie Brown. 
Yeah, it's from Hubie Brown. God, I can't stand that, man. Anyway, uh, yeah, four years, $85 million. Seems a cheap side. I definitely thought the uh, Knicks were going to chuck $100 million at him. Maybe they did, and he just turned it down because he's a smart man. Who knows? Um, but I think it's good for him to go back to Toronto. I feel like, I feel like he's that's the place he's going to thrive the most, and he's going to get the most value out of. I 100% agree. I was literally just about to make that point. I don't think Fred Van Vliet is as good. He's, he's a great player, but I think, like, him with the Raptors, that is where you're going to see the best Fred Van Vliet. So I'm glad Absolutely. for both teams. I mean, he he was an undrafted player, um, a guy who came from humble beginnings. So getting $85 million is nothing to be ashamed of. That is a whole lot of money. And I think a bargain for the Raptors, but I'm glad that he finally got his compensation that he deserves. Absolutely. He certainly deserved it with the way he played. He was a key part in that title team. Yeah, and uh, so a little bit of a makeover for the Raptors this year. Um, they lose their two big man rotation, Marcus Saul and Serge Ibaka. They go to the LA teams respectively, um, but they do get Aaron Baines and Alex Len uh, to man the front court there. They also sign DeAndre Bembry um, from the Atlanta Hawks, and they draft a guy Malachi Flynn, who we both really like coming out of the draft. And they also apparently have lost Rondé Hollis Jefferson as well to the Timberwolves. Chris Haynes broke that news, uh, and he's a pretty trusted reporter, so I, I figure that he is pretty accurate and he's got uh, the right people in his ear. So Matt, what do you think about this, this new roster, if you will? Uh, how do you think the Raptors can kind of adjust and get back toward the top of the East? Well, Hunter, I mean, when you look at this uh, roster right now with the additions and the losses that they've had, and it's hard to see them getting back to where they were last year. They've lost, you know, obviously losing a Baca and Gasol and then bringing in Aaron Baines and Alex. And that's a huge downgrade, man. It, it, that, that is a huge downgrade. I think they're going to take a considerable step back this season uh, and even with the Saul and Ibaka, I think they lost a lot more defensively in terms of that than offense. And while Nick Nurse is a great coach and will get this team back to the playoffs, I think they're a five seed at best. Um, I think there's at least five teams in the East considerably better talent-wise, Milwaukee, Brooklyn, Philly, Boston, and Miami. I agree with the talent point, um, but it's just something about the heart of a champion, man. I feel like the Raptors, I mean, we talk about defense, and, and I think that's the big part here is that they lose their anchors on defense. Uh, Abaka has led the league in blocks before. Marcus All has won Defensive Player of the Year before. So these are two guys that get it done on both ends of the floor, and that that is a big loss. Uh, I think Baines and Len was probably as good as they possibly were going to do after losing both of those guys. Um, they, I mean, I think they were wise to spend the money on Fred Van Vliet first and foremost. He's younger and, and quite frankly, a better player and more important to that team. Uh, so I, I do agree with the philosophy there. Unfortunately. Someone was going to have to cut ties at some point. They pay Pascal Siakam a ton of money. They always extend Kyle Lowry. So, they, they, you know, you can't only pay so many people. Um, but this is definitely going to be a different team this season. Um, so you talked about you think they're not – they're maybe a five seed at best. I think they can maybe climb up to as high as like a three uh, just because I think defensively they're still an extremely good team. Um, but I think that's the floor. I mean the ceiling. I don't think that – they are contending for a championship, but I think they'll make it difficult and, you know, and they'll make it hard on whatever team they play in the playoffs. Well, absolutely. I mean, like you said, the heart of the champion, Hunter, uh, you know, their, their talent or not necessarily their talent, but their heart and their uh, will is never questioned. They're a competitive team night in and night out. So, um, you know, whether it's good enough to get up like a three seed at best, like you said, I don't know. Yeah. And, uh, I, every year, it seems like the Raptors kind of have a couple guys break out. We saw Pascal Siakam be second-team All-NBA this season. Uh, he was an All-Star. They, Of course, Fred Van Vliet, his come up. But I feel like the Raptors are one of the best teams in the NBA in terms of, uh, you know, finding diamonds in the rough and, and really developing uh, young talent as well as any team. Uh, so they got a couple guys here. Uh, they got OG Ananobi. They got Terrence Davis, who was second team all rookie last season, and he wasn't even drafted coming out of Ole Miss. And Chris Boucher, uh, the shot blocking monster out of Oregon. So, Matt, do you see any of these young players, maybe ones I didn't even mention, who can really step up and, and fill that void for the Raptors? Well, I think OG Ananobi has the best chance of the group that you mentioned, and probably the best chance in the rap. Uh, best chance in the Raptors roster of breaking out. He was a 39% three-point shooter last season and should have an expanded role in the offense this season with the loss of Baca and Gasol. He'll slide in to starting small forward there, possibly have Siakam start a power forward. Uh, I think he'll fit nicely next to Siakam and Fred Van Vliet as well. And I think, you know, Kyle Lowry, he's good with playing with anybody. So I think, you know, Ananobi building off of that uh, game winner he had against Boston in game three, of their series, I think uh, I think he'll really take that next step. 
Yeah, uh, I think OG Anobi is is the guy we're looking at. Is what is his ceiling potentially? Uh, I, I think that the groundwork's laid out for Anobi. Um, he's going to be a guy who's probably the best on ball defender they have on that team. Uh, he's going to be the one probably having to guard some of those top perimeter guys across the league, uh, especially you know in that division with Kevin Durant and Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. I think he's got to bury the burden a lot of those times. But his offensive game has gotten better. Like you said, Matt, wasn't much of a shooter coming into the league. Now he's a very respectable one uh, and, and a guy you have to guard out there on the perimeter. Uh, his, his ability to drive, he's really big and strong also. Uh, got a lot of Kawhi Leonard-ish comparisons coming out of draft just in terms of frame and what they were able to do at the same age. I don't think anyone thought he'd be next Kawhi Leonard, but just in terms of defensively speaking, he could be that kind of – versatile defender but a guy I'm very interested in seeing is Terrence Davis because coming off the bench this dude is an absolute bucket he can score on all three levels and I think entering his second season in the league I think we're going to see him take a step forward and really thrive as one of the better scorers coming off the bench yeah the question for Davis is will he become the next Fred Van Vliet for them you know we saw Fred Van Vliet take a huge step from year one to year two um, when he was in, when he was coming in and maybe, you know, with Terrence Davis having a similar background uh, coming undrafted out of a small school or not necessarily a small school, but uh, a school that's not necessarily, necessarily known for basketball uh, coming in undrafted and carving out a nice role for himself in Toronto and with that good coaching staff with Nick Nurse. I think maybe he can be that next for but I don't know if he'll be as good as for Vivley. Yeah, they're different players, uh, but Terrence Davis can really, really score and put him up. Uh, so I think he's kind of like the uh, the guy who I think takes the next step forward. I'm not saying he's going to be an all-star or anything, uh, but I, I'm just saying that he could definitely be uh, that, that next guy for the Raptors who breaks out this season. So looking at another team who did beat the Raptors in the Eastern semis, and that is going to be the Boston Celtics. Um, they had a pretty interesting offseason too. Uh, first off, huge blow, unfortunately. Kemba Walker is expected to miss time up until January with knee surgery. Uh, how do you think Boston is going to be able to, to rebound from this early on? Well, this honestly isn't too long without him considering the start, so the start of the season is the end of December. Uh, I think they'll be fine without him because they have so many stars and so much depth that they should remain highly competitive without him. I would be shocked if they took a huge fall without him. Obviously, Tatum and Brown uh, being the big stars there. And then obviously the depth of Marcus Smart. They now have Tristan Thompson. I think they'll be fine. Yeah, I'm I'm a little concerned long term just because Kemba Walker. It seems like these knee issues are starting to pile up for a guy who I believe is like 30 years old. Uh, so he's I, I'm I'm a little afraid for a guy who relies so much on balance and quick twitch and speed and and, and ball handling. Uh, I'm I'm a little concerned that he may eventually start to degrade a little bit. I hope not because uh, Kemba Walker is one of my, my favorite players to watch in the NBA. He has so much heart and he's just a great player and he's very fun to watch. And I think a leader that the Celtics definitely need, especially because I'm sure this is a team that wants to compete to get to the finals this year. Oh, absolutely. And you know, the, right now you got to be thinking for Boston, is this, is this your finals or bust? Mm -hmm. I, I think they're at the point where it is finals or bust, but Let's talk about probably the biggest move that happened with the Celtics, and, and that was a guy who left, and that is Gordon Hayward. He's now with the Charlotte Hornets, um, signed a four-year, $120 million deal. Uh, the Celtics, I was not in their pay grade at all uh, to sign to that much money, so they had to let him walk. But the interesting thing was is the Indiana Pacers were very interested in Gordon Hayward, up to the point that they were offering Miles Turner and a first-round pick and a sign-in trade and the Celtics turned it down. Matt, was, was that a smart move for them? Uh, were they smart to do that, or do you think they should have pulled the trigger? You can look at this a couple of different ways. There's certainly debate to be made. Uh, I think it's questionable. Uh, Miles Turner would fill, would have filled an immediate need at center for them, and Danny Ainge has never said no to a first-round pick, so I'm, I'm surprised he, he turned that down, um, especially now with Hayward leaving for nothing unless they do a sign-and-trade with Charlotte. This looks like a mistake, uh, although Tristan Thompson is obviously far cheaper uh, than Turner, but Thompson has his offensive limitations, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I I actually kind of agree with the no move. Here's why: you, you're I don't think you can definitely say right. Miles Turner is better than um, Tristan Thompson. They get a first round pick. They don't lose Gordon Hayward for anything. So that's that's the plus to it. Um, but the downside is that Miles Turner gets paid like I think 18 million dollars a year. Like mm -hmm. he, he's very overpaid in my opinion. I don't think he's lived up exactly to what this the teams thought he would be coming out of high school, coming out of college. 
Um, he's a good player, but not worth the price tag. And the Celtics do not like overpaying guys. Uh, that is what they have shown over the years. So I, I think it made sense in that regard. Um, I mean, how many first round picks do you really need if you're the Celtics? Here's your team trying to win now. Tristan Thompson is not as good, but I think they need some toughness and, and a guy who can really like manhandle guys in the paint. He's one of the best offensive rebounders in basketball, Tristan Thompson. He's a champion. I actually think from and the price tag is the key part here. I yeah. actually think from that standpoint, the Celtics, I actually think maybe dodge the bullet here because I, I think Thompson actually feels more of an immediate need than Miles Turner does. They have a guy in Daniel Thice who's a, a similar player. Yeah, and you know, like I said, we could make the argument all day, you know, about uh, which side would have been better. But at the end of the day, there's no way to know until they start playing. And you know, the biggest thing, obviously, like you brought up, is the fact that Miles Turner is making eighteen million dollars a year. It's it's way too much to be paying that guy, and especially when they're as strapped for cash as they are. Uh, you know, they're gonna have they're paying Tatum now. They're paying Jalen Brown's gonna need an extension uh, unless he doesn't already have one. Kemba Walker's on a huge contract. Uh, Marcus Smart is on a decent sized contract. So. You know, paying $18 million to eight, uh, Miles Turner in that situation just wouldn't make sense. And getting Tristan Thompson for as cheap as they got him is a good move. Yeah, and uh, let's talk about some of the moves that the Celtics did make. Uh, also signing Jeff Teague as well. Um, he's going to be a solid backup point guard. He's probably at the start to begin the season, especially with no Kemba Walker there. Uh, they made two first-round picks with Aaron Neesmith and Peyton Pritchard. Uh, they technically added Evan Turner. He is a player development coach, uh, I guess. Um, but uh, they also lost Ennis Cantor, lost Brad Wanamaker as well. So, Matt, what do you think about this roster overhaul? Do you think the Celtics made out better or worse uh, after this offseason? Um, you know, I, it's tough because Gordon Hayward is a big loss, but not that big of a loss because he was their fourth option. Let's be real about that. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't commanding the same uh, offensive load that he was before. Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum took that next step. Jeff Teague, is, I think, is a is a nice move. He was he kind of had a bad year last year, but I think it's a good move. I think he'll fit well with Brad Stevens in that offense. Uh, Evan Turner, it's kind of ironic that he signed to a player development coach considering he sucked at develop, developing himself. So um, that's interesting. And then I think, you know, get, letting go of Anna's Cantor was also a good move for Boston. Uh, I don't think he fit there at all, and he wasn't really good there at all. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. I think Thompson's a huge upgrade, a much-needed guy over Ennis Cantor. Uh, the Gordon Hayward thing kind of sucks. Uh, so that's why I think the Celtics didn't have a great offseason. I don't think they their team got marginally better at all. If not, they at, at best stayed the course. Um, but I, we did actually fail to mention Jason Tatum did sign a max extension, but that was given, of course. He's deserved every single dollar that has gone his way. He was all NBA this season and, and absolutely broke out. But – um, yeah, that's my opinions on it. Um, but the Celtics have, have a lot of young pieces here. Uh, they drafted two guys that we just mentioned. Uh, they had, uh, three guys they drafted last year. Um, do you see any of these, these young developmental players really taking a step forward for Boston this season? Well, it seems like they have a young guy breakout every year. So it's really just a case of which young guy it's going to be. Uh, knowing my luck will probably be Peyton Pritchard after I talked all that rah-rah about me not liking that pick. So um, just for sake of covering myself, I'm going to say Peyton Pritchard going to be the guy that Pritchard breaks out. Really? Because you were very against them taking Peyton Pritchard. Well, I got, I got to cover both sides, Hunter. I got to, I got to, I got to be unbiased. <laughs> yeah. You're just covering, you're just covering. I'm just covering track. my tracks. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Just so that you don't, <laughs> so you can play whichever clip uh, exactly. goes right or yeah. wrong. Yeah, yeah. You did the Kelly Warner here. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Either on, way, I called it. Yeah, she went on our uh, our running gun, uh, the, our, our our football podcast last year, and and picked the Packers to go to the Super Bowl, and then went on kickoff with Kelly and, and picked the 49ers. So yeah, I'm calling you out, Kelly, if you're listening. To this. <laughs> um, don't you mistake it, but um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think the guy who could could break out for them, ugh, man, it's tough. Um, Grant Williams was definitely the the best young player they had last season in that draft. Uh, he was really the only one that they could rely on for any minute. So I'm going to say that's their guy. Uh, maybe it's Aaron Neesmith. Uh, he, he was the best shooter in the draft. And I think he can do a little more than just catch and shoot also. So maybe he can come in right away and be an effective rookie. Uh, those would be my picks. But the one guy who I'm going to say it right now on this podcast, I'm not afraid of it. I'm going to say it right now, Jalen Brown will be an all-star this season. It's going to happen. I think he's the second best player on this team. Matt, what do you think? I think that's certainly possible. I mean, you, you saw him take a huge step this past season. And even in the bubble in the playoffs, he was 
balling out, man. He was, you know, when Jason Tatum was kind of struggling a bit, Jalen Brown never seemed to struggle. He was always consistent. And, you know, defense never goes in a slump, too. And he's a consistent perimeter defender. He's great at uh, getting tips and causing steals. And I think that alone makes him a, a really uh, valued, valuable player. And I think I, I certainly don't disagree that he could be an all-star this season. Yeah, I, I think it's his time, especially if Kemba's going to get off to a slow start. Now, there's, there's not going to be an all-star game to be played. Um, so we're talking about all-star selections here. But I, I think that he's going to get a spot. I really do. Because um, every year, there's always a couple new guys that get in for the first time. And just kind of looking how, how things are going to play out, I think it's going to be Jalen Brown. Uh, that gets it. But let's mm-hmm. talk about the Celtics here. Where do you see them finishing out this season? Um, realistically, what, what's your take on the Celtics? My take is on, on Boston, as much as it pains me, is that they are legit title contenders until proven otherwise. Tatum is going to continue to get a, get better. Brown will continue to be a great sidekick, as we've talked about. Uh, Kemba, if he stays healthy, is still the perfect point guard for this offense. Um, they have so much depth, too. It's hard to see a way where they aren't serious contenders. Yeah, um, I agree. I think they are title contenders. Uh, I think off the top, I'll say they finish as the two seed in the Eastern Conference. Um, I would agree that. Yeah, I think they're really good. Uh, Jason Tatum, maybe, maybe dark horse MVP candidate, uh, mm-hmm. could be, uh, especially the way we saw him end the season and really take that next step forward. And with no Kemba Walker, at least for maybe some games, he's going to you know make a case early on potentially because they're going to have to lean on him a little more. But Seems like we're both pretty high on the Celtics. I'll admit I was not as high on them entering last season. They did prove me wrong, uh, but I'm not going to make that same mistake. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about your team, the Philadelphia 76ers. I know you've been waiting this whole time to talk about them. Uh, talk about a team that uh, you know rearranged the furniture, you know what I mean? <laughs> and thank God for that, brother. Amen. Whew. So the biggest uh, offseason acquisition they made was probably Daryl Morey, uh, who yes, the team and went, hey – this is weird. Let's uh, make it make more sense. So they, they get to it right away. They fire Brett Brown, uh, rightfully so. It was about time. Uh, they hire Doc Rivers, big upgrade. They trade for Danny Green, trade for Seth Curry. Uh, they signed Dwight Howard. Uh, they also signed Tony Bradley as well. Uh, they Also, Terrence Ferguson was in that deal from Oklahoma City Thunder with Danny Green. They draft Tyrese Maxey in the first round, Isaiah Joe and Paul Reed in the second round. Those are some of the additions there. Uh, Matt, what is your opinion on the Sixers roster entering next season? Well, Hunter, just the fact that you listed seven additions to me is just fantastic. They lost three guys, all guys that I was okay with losing. Zaire Smith was an unfortunate story. Um, Al Horford, you know how I feel about him. And Josh Richardson, I like I, I like Jay Rich as a player. But <laughs> stop laughing at me. I like Jay Rich as a player, but um, he just didn't fit with our offense. And, you know, in terms of – additions on this team Daryl Morey did the exact right thing he did exactly what Sixers Twitter wanted him to do he got shooters he we, we have been begging for shooters since we lost JJ Redick since we lost Robert Covington they add Danny Green who had a down season last year I feel like we got him for a pretty pretty cheap uh considering we were targeting him in free agency last season um Seth Curry is a great addition uh statistically a better three-point shooter than Steph Curry, statistically, 44%, oh, second, second best all time. Uh, <laughs> Dwight Howard is a great move because the Sixers need a backup center with how, with how many games Joel Embiid misses and how, you know, the past couple of seasons we've had a significant downgrade on, on the floor when Joel Embiid is not on the floor. And the Sixers need a backup center. Dwight Howard fits that role perfectly. Terrence Ferguson is kind of – he'll fight for minutes, but I like that addition – um, and then even the rookie, rookie Tyrese Maxey, he's wearing number zero. That's dope. Uh, so he's <laughs> rook, put your rookie of the year, uh, put your rookie of the year bets in right now. Uh, I think he's going to be a much better shooter than he was Kentucky. Um, and then even Isaiah Joe and Paul Reed are two other guys that can shoot. And, you know, if they need to get minutes, they can, they can shoot a little bit. So I'm excited to see what this team does. I'm really excited for their, for, uh, for their preseason games, which I'm usually not excited for NBA preseason, but I'm excited. Yeah, I'm curious to see how quickly they can gel or not. Uh, Because the biggest issue with the 76ers last season was team chemistry. The talent was there, uh, but they just couldn't mesh. Um, And this season, I think they had the right pieces, but not a whole lot of playing time together. So, 
do you think it's going to take a little bit or do you think just because it is a better fit, it, it's going to work like right from the start? It's not, it's not going to work from right, right from the start. And when you see that in any sport, you know, they, they need time to play together, uh, especially with Simmons and Embiid. Simmons needs to know how, how to play with these other guys and how to get them in good spots uh, on offense, uh, get them in catch and shoot spots. Um, I think it's going to take a little bit to get together, especially with the new offense of Doc Rivers. Um, I think, but I think they'll get it together quicker than most people think. And I think they'll really start playing good basketball towards the middle of the season. Yeah, uh, the Sixers are definitely one of the most intriguing teams because of all of the moves they made. I agree. I think Josh Richardson, um, good player, but wrong team. Uh, I think he'll fit much better with the Dallas Mavericks, a team that Absolutely. having Seth Curry guard Kawhi Leonard uh, during that first round series. Now they have a more legitimate defender on him. Yeah. But how do you see this starting lineup play out? Uh, who do you think is going to get the bulk of the minutes here? So I think um, I think they're going to kind of run positionless basketball here. So they're going to have Simmons and Bead, Tobias Harris, obviously. Um, I think they will likely start Danny Green um, at shooting guard. Um, who am I missing? I got four players right now, right? Yeah. Simmons, Green, Tobias, and Bead. What am I missing? I don't know. You tell me. I oh, asked. Seth Curry. Seth Curry. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll probably start Seth Curry. Uh, you know what? We'll start Danny Green at small forward and um, Seth Curry at shooting guard. Uh, we'll have two shooters, legitimate shooters. Uh, we'll have Tobias Harris do whatever he does, probably chuck up some bricks, and be get the rebound. Um, I, I think that's a legitimate starting lineup, too, because you have two great shooters. You have – Simmons and Embiid, who are going to play a lot more pick and roll this season. Our Doc Rivers has already said that, which I love. Um, get Tobias Harris some isolation bricks, and we'll be all right. Yeah, uh, I agree with that starting lineup there. Uh, that's that's who I'd roll with. I think that makes the most sense. Uh, and, again, it just, it's just a more complete basketball team than they had last season. It's crazy that one guy just comes in and just fixes all their issues. Like It just shows you how easy it is to do that. And how, how incompetent Elton Brand is as a general manager. Jesus. But um, I guess a, a big move here uh, is, is the rumors of James Harden coming there. Uh, how realistic do you think that is? And, and do you think the Sixers would actually go through with that or should they go through with that if the opportunity is there? Hunter, I don't think they should. If it means moving on from Simmons or Embiid, that's an immediate no from me. Uh, and I don't think they, they won't do it. And, they, and I don't think they should. You know, Darren Warrior has already come out and said, we want to keep Simmons and Embiid here for as long as we can. Is Harden great? Absolutely. Does he necessarily make the Sixers better if you're giving up S Simmons or Embiid? No. Um, especially after they finally got some shooting and depth over the offseason, they probably have to let go of a lot of that depth in order to get Harden. And I don't think they do it unless his price drops a lot, which it won't because it's James Harden. So I, th I like the roster construction right now. I don't think they necessarily need James Harden if it's going to destroy the rest of their roster. Yeah, I think for now they should definitely run it with what they got this season for sure. Um, see where it lands them. If they still have some issues, maybe it is a Simmons MB problem after all. But I think they did the best job they possibly could to put both of those guys in a situation to succeed. I'm very curious to see what Doc Rivers does with all these guys as well um, because, I mean, they have a really high ceiling. So, Matt, uh, unbiasedly here, how, how well do you think the Sixers could possibly play this season? Unbiasedly, I'm going to say um, – no, seriously, unbiasedly, I wouldn't say that they're one of the best teams in the league. But you can make an argument about them being a top-four team in the East. Uh, they finally have the things they've lacked since their first playoff run. Shooting, spacing, and guys that complement Simmons and Embiid well. They'll be better than last year, certainly. They won't be a sixth seed again. Um, and I think they'll be better than most people are going to project them to be. Um, but in terms of being a title contender, I don't know if I can say that yet, but I think they can certainly be a top four seed in the East. Yeah, I, I think there may maybe you're a little ways away from, from title contention. I think you have to see um, this, this collective go into the playoffs first and see how they compete um, for me to feel more confident about that just because I am more confident with other teams right now across the league and in the Eastern Conference. I Absolutely. think that they are definitely one of the six best teams in the East. I, I think they're six on the most confident I am of them. Ouch. Um, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I, I think the Bucs will definitely finish higher. I think the Celtics will finish higher. Um, I'm banking on the talent of the Nets, but they can really go a lot of different ways. Um, and then there's – I think the Heat are a better team still. And then there's the Raptors. And so I think that's the one maybe you can debate a little bit. But I think the Sixers are the Raptors. 
that that may be the one I, I'm a little more lenient toward. But uh, I think they 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 are they're the boomer bust team in the East again, in my opinion. They can I don't think they'll bust as much, but I I think their floor is higher. But I think they're a team. It's like they could win it. They got the talent. Um, so yeah. I'm curious curious to see how that plays out. Yeah, my biased opinion though is that uh, Sixers and six. Yeah, okay. in every series. Yeah, yep. Sixers and six. Yep, just to keep with that's my bias opinion. Um, but let's talk about the team that had probably, you know, was going to be the biggest difference. Oh, actually, breaking news. Um, no way, really? Yep. LeBron signs a two year, $85 million max extension with the Lakers. So is that adding on to the two years he had left on the deal? So he'll be there for four years then? Yep. Nice. Okay, good for him. Uh, yeah, good for, good for LeBron. So how, wait, wait. Here's the real question: How does that align with Bronny's draft stock? When when does Bronny graduate high school? Oh God, <laughs> Bronny twenty. Oh boy, twenty. Because he's a sophomore right now, right? Why do yeah. I know this? Thanks a lot, Sports Center. Sports 20, Center makes wait, me know Bronny's 20, entire life. Twenty twenty three. He graduates high school. I, I guess we shouldn't know this, man. He's sixteen. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to guess by his year. Uh, and so then, so then he'll play one year of college, most likely, or. By that point, probably like the G League or something. Um, so 2024. 2024 would be like his earliest eligibility. Yeah. So what – so that – this does games. this contract take LeBron through 2024? I don't think so. Um, I think because he signed, he signed 21, a – 22, 23, 20. Yeah, so this one takes him through like 2021. 22, 23, 24. All right, so, so LeBron like, knows what he's doing, dude. He's LeBron trying to play with Bronny. Bronny is coming to the Lakers confirmed. Uh, he's good, no, he's trying to try to go wherever Bronny gets drafted. That's where LeBron's going. I Oh, I'm about – dude, save this podcast for four years from now. He is going wherever Bronny's going. Yeah. <clears> I can feel my bones. Right here. Uh, breaking news. I'm bald, don't lie. I'm making even bolder predictions. Uh, oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, well, maybe LeBron's son comes straight out of high school. They change the rules. There's uh, rumors of that that may happen, so – Interesting. Uh, it'd be interesting. But uh, let's talk about the Brooklyn Nets here, um, who might be the most interesting team entering this season. Uh, huge overhaul like the Sixers. They bring in Steve Nash there, who hires Mike D'Antoni and Mari Stoudemire to be assistant head, coach, assistant head coaches. Um, or assistant coaches. I said assistant head coaches. I'm like, I mean, that's technically right, but that sounds weird. Uh, we've already talked about that on our podcast a little bit, so I don't want to dive too deep into that. Um, but – I think the, the biggest player acquisition or, or maybe um, one that they kept actually is Joe Harris. He re-signs for four years, $72 million. And we talk about Fred Van Vliet being underpaid. Do you think it's an overpay for Joe Harris? That is a – Hunter, that is a hefty sum for a guy with such a common white guy name. That is that is a lot of money for a guy that sounds like he's in his 40s on his couch. That That's not a – I mean, granted, he's a good shooter. He's a good shooter. But is he worth $72 million? I don't know about all that. I think that just shows you how much teams value three point shooting. I, I absolutely. I don't really think they needed him to be honest because they have a lot of good guards there. Um, but I'll say this: you know, when they traded him uh, from Cleveland to Brooklyn in that trade, um, that they got a lot of value. Joe Harris so he broke out with the Nets, uh, became a good player for them. Um, he was a Kenny Atkinson guy. He's not there anymore, but uh, they they feel confident enough in him that they're going to keep him around and and surround. Uh, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant with more shooters there. Yeah, I mean, you can never say no to enough shooting. So, I mean, I guess it's a good deal, but not worth $72 million. Yeah, um, but other moves they made, they signed Bruce Brown, uh, they signed Jeff Green, they drafted Reggie Perry, and then they also got Landry Shaman as well, who, again, is a similar player to Joe Harris. I think Harris is better, but um, Shaman is cheaper. So, and then also they lose Garrett Temple. I actually think that's a bigger loss than people think. And here's why he is a veteran. Like, people love him. Like, he's like the, the solid uh, locker room guy. And, and we even saw, and he can still play. He's not a bad player. He signed with the Bulls. I'm sure he'll get playing time there. Uh, but we even saw with the Lakers, like, they value that locker room uh, presence with a Quinn Cook and a Jared Dudley and stuff like that. Like, that, and that helped them win a championship despite these guys not really playing. Uh, so what do you think about the loss for Garrett Temple? Do they have like that same guy in the locker room, the Nets, that can really kind of calm things down when things are going south? Well, I, I think, like you said, it is a bigger loss than people think. And even when, you know, Kyrie was going on his tirade last year where he was saying the Nets weren't playing well and all that, and the, you know, remember that report that came out where he was like talking about like who we would want around and he didn't like the coach anymore. I think Garrett Temple was one of the guys who he wanted around. Um, and, you know, if Kyrie and Katie are saying they want Garrett Temple around, you don't have him around anymore, 
that, that's probably a bigger loss than people think. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was I was a little shocked they kind of let him walk, especially because like I I highly doubt he was going to be that expensive for them. Um, oh, definitely not. The Bulls uh, paid up for him. They they feel a little more confident in Garrett Temple, I guess. But a lot of new players. This is probably going to be you know one one of the most different teams. They went from being a team that squeaked by into the playoffs last year to a team that is going to be expectations wise competing for a championship. That's what you do when you bring Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving. So. Do you think there's going to be a learning curve here? Uh, do you think they're going to get off to a slow start? Or do you think it, it could be one of those instances where they're, they're guns blazing from the jump? I'm glad you brought this up, Hunter, because, you know, obviously the short and offseason off makes things quite a lot hectic, quite more hectic than they would be normally. Um, to me, they remind me a lot of the Cavs team in 2014, 2015, when LeBron came back and they added Kevin Love. And they kind of started the first few weeks of that season because they were learning how to play with each other. Uh, and this team reminds me of that, especially with their two best players coming off of major injuries. Katie himself said he w- isn't 100 percent quite yet. And with a coach who has never coached before leading the way in Steve Nash, there will certainly be a big learning curve. I 100 percent agree with you. I really do. Um, they might be the most talented team in the East, but I don't think they're going to finish um, at the top. Uh, at least in the regular season, because I just think it's going to, there's so much moving pieces here. Not only that, you have to worry about, all right, well, Karis LeVert completely broke out in the bubble for them. And what's, I mean, he's obviously going to be the third guy there, but like now he's got to adjust. Spencer Dinwiddie has got to adjust. Joe Harris has to adjust. Jared, maybe not Jared Allen. He kind of has a defined role there. But a lot of these guys, you're going to have to like, figure out there's only one basketball on the court. And mm-hmm. then you have to play behind Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant, who have never really played much together outside of like Team USA. So yeah. I, I think it's going to be a huge adjustment. Um, but if they're able to really click and Steve Nash puts these guys in the right situation, I mean, this is a team we're talking about that could win the Larry O'Brien this year. Yeah. And in terms of, you know, hiring a, a guy like Steve Nash, um, this reminds me a lot of the Steve Kerr hire. And I think we might've talked about this when uh, the, the net, the Nets first broke this news, they were hiring Steve Nash. Um, you know, he's a player's coach and he's going to, you know, obviously he knows, how to play the game of basketball. He was one of the best point guards of all time. Um, and I think, you know, having that I, that high IQ is going to help him a lot, not only with coaching with X's and O's, but also with the camaraderie of a team and ha- being able to have the coach-to-player conversations with a bunch of their players, especially when you have a lot of personalities like Durant and Kyrie Irving. Yeah, I think that's going to be the biggest thing is, is, is dealing with those two egos. They're two of the most emotional players in the NBA. So keep it real here. Um, but two of the most talented too, and at least they wanted to play together. So I mean, yeah. that's that's good. It's not like they got forced into a situation they didn't want to be in. Uh, I definitely mm-hmm. think that helps. Um, but I talked about Caris Avert a little bit because um, there's rumors that um, that they may trade for a third guy, a third star, if you will. Uh, Bradley Beal's names come up. Uh, Kevin Durant shot down the James Harden rumors. He's like, I've never talked to him about playing here in Brooklyn. Um, but do you think that the Nets are going to make some moves during the course of the season? Um, it could be the big move. Maybe it's a small move. Or do you think they're, they're, they're really confident in what they currently have? So here's, here's my hot take, Hunter. Okay. I think they're – I mean, I guess it's not that hot of a take, but I think they're the obvious favorites for Harden. And I think they do pull the trigger, but they pull it right before the regular season starts. They'll get a few weeks of practice and a couple of preseason games in and realize how great they would be if they had Harden and they get it done. I think Durant not speaking to Harden about it is a bunch of baloney. Durant is a proven liar. So he, he's, he's gotten really good at lying over the past couple of years. So I think that is just a bold face lie that he told the media, um, try not to create a storm about it. So, and also that's tampering. So why would he admit to that? Um, I, I think they, I think they make the move pardon. Yeah. Kyrie Irving doesn't have a great track record either. After <laughs> the balls that he was staying in left, but, um, but uh, yeah, that's, that is pretty bold. I actually don't think that happens. I think that, I think Harden gets one more year in Houston. Um, I, I, I think so. I think it's more because Rockets value him. I think Westbrook it will be the first one traded on that team. Um, but if the Rock, if, if the Nets offer some crazy deal, um, for Harden uh, that the Rockets can't refuse, I mean, you're going to take it. I mean, we, we saw the Brooklyn Nets give up their entire future before. It's not like they won't right. do it again, <laughs> except this one makes a little more sense because Harden's in his prime, not for a bunch of old washed up, uh, Hall of Famers. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, here's the thing with that trade. I think if the Rockets are offered Karis LeVert and any kind of combination of players after that, I think if they're offered Karis LeVert, they take it. And they should, because Karis LeVert can 
score at in bunches. And I think he would fit with Houston really well. And I think they would kind of rebuild, obviously, if um, if Harden does end up getting traded. But I think Karis LeVert is a nice compensation. All right. So um, I guess, you know, we, we think these, these two rosters may look a little different uh, coming into the season. But do you think, given, given everything with the Brooklyn Nets that we know, do you think that this team – can can legitimately contend for the NBA championship year one with this this core that they have. Well, I think if they don't, there will be a lot of noise from the media and maybe lead to some inner tur- inner turmoil. Uh, they have a lot of lost expectations. Obviously, that's what happens when you bring in Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. Um, they've made too many big moves to not be in contention from the get go, and for that reason alone, I think they will be in contention just because I think they have to. And if they if they aren't, there's going to be a lot of noise. I can already hear Stephen A. Smith in my ears. Oh boy. Um, I, I will say, yes, I think they'll be in contention. I think they will be one of those teams that teams will be afraid to face in the playoffs, especially if they get hot toward the end of the season, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving have hit some of the biggest shots that we've seen in the playoffs. Um, both of these guys say what you want about, but they show up when the lights are the brightest. So you gotta give them credit. Um, I think Harris Levert, if they don't trade him, uh, for James Harden, I think he actually could potentially become that third guy if he can stay healthy. Uh, he is really, really talented. Uh, if, if the Nets get off to a really hot start, maybe he's a guy who can make the all-star team this year. Uh, if they're, like, dominating from the jump and it's like we got to put multiple of these guys in there. Uh, but I definitely think that this is definitely – we talked about the Sixers being a boomer bust team. I think the Nets could be too. I think, again, they'll make the playoffs, I think, as they did last year with – given they, half their team was, like, not even in the bubble. But – um, and a coaching overhaul, but I, I think the Nets are definitely, you know, the biggest boomer bust team this season. I think so too. They're, they're, I don't know if their finals are bust quite yet just because it is year one with those two together, but, uh, if they aren't as competitive as people expect, there's going to be a lot of noise. So we're going to go from the biggest boomer bust team to the biggest buster, terrible team. And that's going to be the New York Knicks. Uh, <laughs> ouch. But, uh, Interesting offseason. They really didn't do much of anything. Uh, three three draft picks here. They take Obi Toppin, who is their guy, Emmanuel Quickly, and Daniel Oturu. Uh, also signing Alec Burks, Nerlens Noel, Austin Rivers, Amari Spellman, and undrafted free agent. Or, yeah, undrafted free agent Miles Powell. They lose Bobby Portis, Wayne Ellington, Damian Dotson, Taj Gibson, Mo Harkless, Theo Pinson. So this isn't a great team on paper. They're probably going to be toward the bottom of the NBA, but. Matt, was it smart, in your opinion, for the Knicks to have maybe – was the best move a no move for the Knicks? I, I think so because, you know, they finally learned how to rebuild after 20, we, 20 years of mediocrity and chucking big money at big names past their primes, i.e. Tracy McGrady. So they need to keep rebuilding and just keep doing what they're doing and show that they have faith in these young guys and build around them. They need to have RJ Barrett make a big step this year. They need, they need to see something from Obi top and uh, Mitchell Robinson needs to show, continue to show that he's a legitimate center uh, and that they keep, need, they need to keep rebuilding. Uh, I, that doesn't mean I said it'd be good, but they need to keep having those guys improve. Oh, that's great. You mentioned RJ Barrett. Cause we can talk about him a little bit here. Uh, our favorite on the podcast. Uh- so he actually recently just said um, that he's motivated not making all rookie this season. Uh, and he's well, one of the, the prized possessions on the Knicks. We talk about Obi top in here, uh, Mitchell Robinson. Um, do you see any of these young guys really taking a step forward this year for the Knicks? Well, they better, or this franchise is screwed. Uh, oh. <laughs> I do have some decent expectations for Toppin uh, being that he is a New Yorker and he seemed really amped to play for this team, which can't be said about a lot of other prospects. <laughs> so I think that alone will make him, will make him a better player. Um, but RJ Barrett, he should be motivated by not making all rookie because he stunk last year. So if he can use that motivation to become a better player and a more efficient scorer, then yes, use that motivation. Maybe he will break out into someone that the Knicks can build around. Yeah. I think um, I look at guys like the Aaron Fox and miles bridges. These are two guys that, that didn't make all rookie and then really took a step forward in their next years, especially the Aaron Fox. Uh, I know they're all lefties, but uh, so I don't know if that's a coincidence or not, but RJ Barrett, you know, he was taken third overall in a draft that was viewed as a three franchise player draft from the start. And RJ Barrett was one of those three guys. The Knicks were really happy to get him, And he was really happy to be there. And I think that's good that they have guys like Toppin and Barrett, 
who are extremely competitive and want to be Knicks. I mean, I don't know why you'd want to be a New York Knick. They're not very good. But the fact that they want to be there, I think, is a huge plus for this team. Yeah, you, that can't be understated enough because oftentimes you'll see guys get drafted to places they don't want to be, and it affects them from the outset. And just the fact that those guys even want to be there is a win for the Knicks. Yeah, and um, they still have over $18 million in cap space, uh, so maybe there's a move to be had, but maybe not. I think Leon Rose might just be playing it conservative here, playing it safe and, and not making a move and just saving that money for whatever else needs to be. But Wait, did, they on, may- did, you say eight, did you say $18 million in cap space? Yes. Isn't that just Joakim Noah's contract? <laughs> it could be uh, a bunch of yeah. dead cap right there. Uh, exactly. All right, Pete. But uh, all I'm saying is, Todd Gibson is still out there if they want to use that 18 million. Oh boy, uh, <laughs> overpay for power forwards again. That's yes. a great idea. Uh, <laughs> Leon Rose is like, no, let's not do that. Uh, and he'll get fired in it, and then <laughs> they'll just be back to mediocrity again. But um, best case scenario for the Knicks, um, how do you see that playing out? What would be considered like a realistic? Uh, good season for the Knicks? Um, you know, if they aren't the worst team in the league, they're damn close to it. Uh, but, I, you know, best case scenario for them this season is to see some serious progression from Barrett, Mitchell Robinson, and uh, Obi Toppin, while also simultaneously having the worst record in the league so they can be in contention for the first-round pick, or not for the first overall pick. Uh, in, all serious, though, in all seriousness, though, they at least need to see a future with these young guys, and they need to see that these picks they've made over the past couple of years have been worth it. Um, and if that means, you know, Barrett and Toppin play really well together and the rest of the team stinks, then I'd still consider that a win for the next. Yeah, and also worth mentioning, Tom Thibodeau is now the head coach of the team as well. It's going to be his first season with the Knicks. We'll see if R.J. Barrett leads the league in minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is what he loves to do, uh, and I'm sure R.J. Barrett will get all the shots he wants. Uh, but, yeah, you got to see what you got in these young guys. Um, we also talk about Oturu out of Minnesota, Emmanuel Quickly out of Kentucky. They also have Kevin Knox there, who really hasn't panned out yet. Uh, so you got to see what you have in them, see who's a keeper, who's not, and then you move from there. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about uh, the Northwest Division. Uh, they were arguably one of the best divisions in the NBA last season. They had four teams make the playoffs. Uh, we're going to start off with – the division leaders, and that was the Denver Nuggets. Um, not the best offseason, in my opinion. Um, they they do re-sign Paul Millsap. I think that was good. Um, but they lose Jeremy Grant, Mason Plumley, and Torrey Craig, three guys that, that really played good minutes for them uh, throughout this, this playoff run, especially Jeremy Grant, what he did in the playoffs. Apparently, the, the Nuggets actually matched the Pistons' offer, and he declined it and said, no, I'm going mm-hmm. to Detroit. So how do you think the Nuggets can kind of rebound from these couple of losses? Who has to step up for them? Well, you know, obviously I'm going to look at Paul Millsap because they brought him back. I didn't think they would, um, but a one-year $10 million deal is a prove-it deal. Let's, let's call it what it is. It is. And, uh, you know, any one-year deal is a prove-it deal. Uh, $10 million is pretty cheap, especially considering what his last contract was with Denver. Um, I think he will play much better. Um, he'll be the main guy now, right now, at that four spot for Denver. So I, I think he is the biggest one to keep an eye on because he was their biggest move in free agency to bring him back. Um, and, you know, after losing Jeremy Grant, Mason Plumlee, uh, Torrey Craig, all those guys, I think Paul Millsap, you need to see something out of him because he's the only guy you brought back. And I think the fact that they let some of these guys go makes me suggest that they are very confident in Michael Porter Jr., He's yeah. got to have to become that, that, that guy for them. Uh, we saw it in the bubble. He was, you know, all bubble team, if you will, uh, announced by the NBA. He's extremely talented. I think he still has a lot of room to grow. He went 14th overall in the draft. A guy who a lot of Knicks fans thought were going to take and then didn't. Uh, they probably should have because he's better than Kevin Knox. But, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think he's definitely the guy you look for. And not only that, but the emergence of Jamal Murray. I mean, this guy was one of the best players in the playoffs and hit some of the biggest shots uh, for Denver and a big reason why they came back in those 3-1 games. Do you think he can carry that into this season and be, you know, one of those top guards in the league? Well, I think he's going to be an all-star this year. Um, it always feels like players who break out the season before end up making the all-star team the next year, regardless of how they're performing that season, just because now the fans are familiar with them. Um, but he has taken that next step, and he is a legitimate star for this team going forward. We saw it in the playoffs. He was 
legit. You know, he was going up against LeBron with no fear, and he was awesome in those plays. He had some huge shots, um, and they certainly paid him like it too. They certainly paid him like they expected him to be a franchise cornerstone for the next couple of years for them. So I think he will take the next step, and I think he'll be an all-star this season. I think he's going to be an all-star too. I agree. I think it's time for Jamal Murray. They gave him max dollars. Um, a lot of people thought they overpaid for him, but they knew what they had in Jamal Murray. That was a star in the making. He, mm-hmm. he seems to play his best basketball when he needs to. Uh, he got a lot better as a playmaker. Uh, shot selection has improved. Efficiency has improved. He's improved. Uh, defensively, he's not a liability. He can guard some guys. So I think that it is time for Jamal Murray. Him and Jokic are one of the most fun center guard combos in the league because Jokic is like a pass first guard and then Jamal Murray is like a score first point guard. It's like kind of the mm-hmm. opposite roles, but they complement each other really well. And uh, and I think Denver, you know, they, they got their cornerstones. So they got to fill out everything else there. Absolutely. And, you know, we're going to look at some young guys too to step up for them. Uh, PJ Dozier, Bull Bull, RJ Hampton, to name a few. Um, and I'm really looking at RJ Hampton. I think he was a steal for them in the draft, and I think he can be a legit scorer off the bench for this team. I think, you know, he he kind of fell a little bit in that draft. I expect him to go a little bit higher than he was drafted at 24. Um, I think he could be a, a great steal for them, much like Michael Porter Jr. was. Yeah, the interesting thing about R.J. Hampton is he actually reclassified. So he actually mm-hmm. was the senior year of high school, went overseas in Australia, the same league that LaMelo Ball played in. Wasn't as good. Um, but So he's actually a little young for his age. And I, the Nuggets, they, they've developed these guards pretty well, as they've shown over the years. Uh, R.J. Hampton is no exception. I wonder how much of a contribution he makes year one, but I do like the pick, Matt. They actually traded to get him because uh, I believe uh, someone else took him. And then they're like, nope, that's our guy. We want to get him. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's the confidence they have in this kid. Uh, that was someone they were targeting. And Zeke Nagy was another. Uh, Dre, a team that went to the conference finals had two first-round picks uh, mm-hmm. because Zeke Nagy also went in the first round for them. And, and he's an energy guy out of Arizona. Late bloomer, uh, rose up the draft boards pretty late and solidified himself as a first-round pick. Um, uh, I think the, the guy who I look at as the young guy who I actually I really like is P.J. Dozier. The um, reason why I say that is because they've lost some depth at that guard position over the years. Uh, they, they lose Malik Beasley, uh, uh, for example. But I think he can step up. And, and not, I'm not saying he's going to be like a star player or anything, but be a good guy off the bench. Um, so when – and especially if Gary Harris is in and out of the lineup like he always is, uh, Doja could be a guy who can come in and give him real minutes. Yeah, I, I liked P.J. Dozier as well. You know, it, people forget he started with the Sixers. He was on – I covered a game where he was uh, on the summer league team, and he played really well. He was their leading scorer, and, you know, classic Sixers, they let him go. Um, <laughs> but I, I do like the way that he can score. And like you said, they have lost a lot of uh, guard depth over the past couple of years, especially with Gary Harris being out, like you said. So I think he can carve out a nice role, continue to carve out a nice role for himself. Yeah, he's a guy who's just very, very smooth. Uh, Three-point shots still needs to get a little better, uh, especially with Denver there. Uh, but uh, he, he's a winner. He won games at South Carolina. They went to the Final Four with him. Um, and then now he's proven to be, you know, a good player on a valuable team in Denver. Uh, and I think maybe not signing some of these guys, they feel confident that, you know, he can be that guy potentially. Uh, and because the, the Denver Nuggets are a team that always thrives because they're deep. And they have a lot of guys that can give it to you. Um, so we saw them make this crazy comeback, the 3-1 kids, uh, the comeback kids, if you will. Uh, they take down the Jazz. They take down the Clippers. They, they give the Lakers a tough six-game series. Do you see them as a legit title contender this season? I think so. Uh, they should be a top three team in the West again this season. They have no reason to not be. You know, they lost a lot of death players like we talked about, but they still have Jamal Murray. They still have Nikola Jokic. Michael Porter Jr. should take that next step. Um, they've retooled in different ways. And I think that alone continue, you know, at the very least will make them sustain the success that they've had. And it shouldn't drop them lower than the three seed. Yep. Also, they get Will Barton back probably as well. He was not really there in the bubble. Uh, that's a big addition. A guy who can score 13 to 15 a game. Um, they also signed Jamichael Green. Uh, so he'll be a rotation player for them. And of course, you can't forget the magnificent Bull Bull, who you hey. never know with him. Uh, maybe he becomes, uh, the next Kevin Durant next season. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> but let's look at the Oklahoma State Thunder, a team that's probably going to go from one of the better, you know, nice stories in the league to probably dead last in the NBA. But that's because they're hoarding all these picks. Uh, they're building for the future. They traded Chris Paul, Stephen Adams, let Dale Gallinari go, trade Dennis Schroeder, trade Terrence Ferguson, Billy Donovan walks away. Um, didn't really make a whole lot of uh, 
you know, got a lot of great players. They got Alexi Pokashevsky, um from uh, – they got they traded for him. He's pretty good, uh, but we'll see how he forms. Uh, apparently, Trevor Ariza, who they also got, is the all-time leader in NBA history for the amount of times being traded. I can believe that. <laughs> he's been on a different team, I think, every year he's been in the league. I, I was shocked when you said he was on that Lakers NBA championship team a couple podcasts ago. I totally forgot about that. He's been around so long. Yeah, he's been on he, so many he's different teams. Uh, in 09. And then George Hill, they also got two. Guy will they'll probably also trade at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess best case scenario for them is Shea Gilgis Alexander becomes an all-star and Lou Dort is defensive player of the year. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will ride the Lou Dort defensive player of the year train. I fuck I, I freaking love that guy, dude. He's a I'll ride that train, dude. He's a, he's got a dope name and he's a pretty good player. He'll average 18 with this team, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but no, honestly though. Uh, they don't really have a whole lot to work with. Shea Gillis Alexander's like Will Smith when he walks in the house and just doesn't see everything. <laughs> everything's gone uh, from the print, press Prince of Bel Air. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't really think this team really amounts to anything. Uh, Sam Presti's basically going to be seen at middle school games scouting out sixth graders. Uh, yep. That's pretty much what those draft picks are going to be. He's like, you're a future Oklahoma State Thunder. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> come to the team. Uh, but in all honesty, though, uh, so we, this has been this debate going on, that the Thunder are basically just the best farm system in the NBA. Uh, the, the Kevin Durant leaves, wins a championship. Westbrook leaves, goes to a better team. Harden leaves, becomes one of the best offensive players we've ever seen. Um, Schroeder leaves, goes to the Lakers. Victor, Ode- Victor Odipo leaves, becomes an all-star. Um, so it, it's like kind of a joke that all these guys leave. Serge Ibaka leaves, becomes a champion. Um, so let me ask you, Matt. Do you think the Thunder, these draft picks actually amount to anything? Or is it just going to be, you know, same situation that the Thunder are just going to be stuck in this tank for eternity kind of thing? Well, I mean, they, they better work out because they've traded everything of value for all of these picks going back to last year when they traded um, when they traded Paul George. So Presti better be able to see it through and make something out of it because if not, oh boy, are they screwed. Um, yeah, I don't I, – I really actually don't think this is going to work out for them. I really don't. Wow. Here's why. They, 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 they did this before. They drafted Kevin Durant. Mm-hmm. They drafted Russell. Yeah. Westbrook, they drafted James Harden. And they couldn't win with that. They drafted three MVPs. There is no way that they are drafting three MVPs with these draft picks. It's just not going to happen. The odds yeah. that happening are so slim. It's probably never really happened before. And they, they did it. They struck lightning in a bottle three years in a row. It was 07 Durant, 08 Westbrook, 09 Harden. There's no way they're going to do that again. I just don't see it happening. Maybe – Maybe I'm wrong. They, 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 or maybe they trade some of those picks and get some, some proven commodities there. But I'm just not sold yet. I'm really not. I think the Thunder are just going to be stuck in this. I, I do. Oh well, I hope not for their sake because they've traded, like I said, they traded everything of value um, they've had over the past couple of years for all these picks. Um, but in terms of you know having all these picks, I do think that they'll end up probably trading most of the ones in 2025, 2026, all those picks because at that point theoretically they should be better and they should be looking to build around a star player looking to build like looking to get guys that will come at that star player or whatever uh, probably end up trading those picks but who knows at this point I mean like you said they hit lightning in the bottle three years in a row and they traded all those guys so or well I guess they didn't trade the ramp but yeah you know it didn't work it, I, it, yeah it, yeah it didn't work out so I'm interested to see what happens yeah, I am too. I mean, yeah, like I'm like they, they did this before. I think people forget that. I'm like they, this happened before. But let's talk about a team that is a little more stable. The Utah Jazz. They signed Donovan Mitchell to a full max contract extension. I mean, well deserved. Deserves every penny of that. Um, but talking about a team that you know hasn't really competed for a championship legitimately since like the Car Malone John Stockton days. Do you think that the the Jazz can actually build a title contender around Donovan Mitchell? To be pretty honest, I don't think so as long as Rudy Gobert is still there. I don't think Gobert is a legitimate second option, and I think as long as he is there, I don't see them seriously competing. Um, this doesn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, the the feud they had because I think that's in the past. But I just don't think that Rudy Gobert, that he's a legitimate second option because he is so limited in what he can do offensively. He's a great defensive player. Nobody's doubting that. But in this day and age, he is so limited offensively for the position that he plays. Uh, I, I just don't see them being legit title contender with Rudy Gobert still in the picture. 
Yeah, and it's worth noting, too, that they're currently trying to uh, negotiate a contract extension with him. And for a lot of those reasons, I mean, he's become a better offensive player. Like, he averages 16 a game. That's, like, not a liability. But you're right. Like, I mean, they need him because defensively, this team is so much worse when he's not on the court and you see it. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's one of the best defensive players in the league. No doubt about it. But, yeah, I mean, you just kind of wonder because, like, I mean, Embiid's a good defender and he can give you 25 a game. Like, you know, yep. uh, and, and offense is very important. So, um, but I do think looking at the short term here, the Jazz definitely are going to be, I think, better this season uh, in terms of what we saw because Boyan Bogdanovich is going to be back. Uh, Quinn Snyder says he wants to use him a little more in the post, use him all over different places. Also a big shot maker. He's always hit clutch shots, whether – He's with the Pacers or the Jazz. He's in multiple game winners. Um, so, and also re-signing Jordan Clarkson, I think, was a really big deal, too. Uh, four years, $52 million, a guy who came in and, and really probably was the best scorer on that team, not named Donovan Mitchell. So, they get the scoring back, Matt. So, I guess looking at this year alone, uh, how competitive can the Jazz be? I think they could be competitive, but I don't, I don't think they're title contenders, like I said. Uh, I think they're probably going to be the same range they were last year, four, five, six seats, somewhere in that area. Um, you know, Bogdanovich is obviously a big, uh, big return for them. Jordan Clarkson is a big return for them. He had a great year last year, but my question for Clarkson is whether he will continue to have a great year. You know, obviously he was in a contract year last year. Maybe that motivated him to play better. Um, but I do think he's in the best situation possible for him in Utah. Um, but the guy, like the guy I'm really focusing on right now is Mike Conley. Hmm. Can he improve his play from last season? Because in terms of Conley, I think, you know, we did see him improve a lot in the bubble bubble. And he played really well in the playoffs. So they can get that version of Conley instead of the regular season version of Conley from last year. I think they'll be in a good spot, but I don't see them being anything higher than a four or five seed. Yeah, it's weird with the Jazz. I mean, I feel like kind of the same. They, they play defense first off. And I, I am a firm believer of teams that play defense are, are more better off because uh, there's a lot of guys who can score and they have those guys. Uh, I do think they'll be better this year. Um, I, I'm not going to go as far as to say they'll be a top three seed in the West, but I think they can get to like five or six probably. Uh, and in a stack Western conference, that's pretty good. I think they're, mm -hmm. they're going to make the playoffs and I think they'll, they'll compete against whoever they play against. Um, but yeah, I just think there's some better teams out there in the West teams are a little bit higher upside. I think we know who the jazz are. Um, and that's my opinion, but a really good team. Um, they, they get Derek favors there. Uh, he comes back and, and can be that backup center of Rudy Gobert. And they've kind of struggled to find a backup big. Uh, so I guess good for them that they got their favors there. But, yeah, it seems like uh, the Jazz are kind of just going to be one of those teams that's going to be pretty good every year. You can rely on them, uh, but just not, you know, they're just never going to take that that next step forward. Yeah, I, th I think they're the definition of good but not great. Exactly. So let's talk about a team that just got in the playoffs last season, the Portland Trailblazers. Uh, they, they trade for Robert Covington. Sign Ennis Cantor, sign Derek Jones, sign Harry Giles, uh, trade Trevor Eliza. They let Hassan Whiteside walk, gave up two first rounders and a reason for Robert Covington. Um, so, how important do you think this trade was? Was maybe, I mean, you probably say it was worth it, but uh, how much of an impact will Robert Covington make on this Trailblazers team? Listen, I like Robert Covington as much as the next guy. Process saves it for life. <laughs> but two first rounders for Robert Covington seems like a lot to give up and also kind of seems like a desperate move for a team that really needed some perimeter defense. Did they fill a need? Absolutely. Well, it, was it worth two first rounders? I'm not sure about that. But Robert Covington, you know, you know what you're going to get from him. You're going to get three point shooting and defense. He is the definition of a three D three and D player. They needed a guy at small forward who could do that. Um, they needed perimeter defense. Like I said, it's a good move, but I don't know if two first rounders is a lot is, um, a necessary move for Robert. Yeah, I think it's buyers beware, Matt. I totally agree because you you clearly saw how much they struggled last season um on the perimeter. It was bad. Like they were having Gary mm -hmm. Trent Jr. pick up LeBron. I'm like, yeah, Gary Trent's like six four and LeBron's like six nine. Like this is not yeah. it's not what you want out there. Um so they really needed a guy, Robert Covington, I think is the perfect fit there. And I think he slides right into that small forward role and is really good right away. I mean, he was guarding centers last year for a while with the Rockets. So yeah. uh, he can guard just about anybody at this point. Uh, so that was a great get for them. The perfect type of, of small forward they need. And I think a big, a big reason why I'm actually a little higher on the Blazers than a lot of people this year is because of health. They're going to have a healthy Zach Collins, a healthy use of Nurkic, a healthy Rodney Hood. He's back. They re-signed him. 
So I, I think, and even Damon CJ missed games last year too. Um, so I think the fact that they're healthy is going to be a big win. Let's not forget this team did go to the Western Conference Finals just two years ago. I, I'm not going to say title contender or anything like that, but I think I could see them finishing top five in the West. I, I really could. Well, I mean, first things first, they, they need to be a contender from the start this year. They obviously can't play the way they did last season, stumbling out of the gates. Um, but if their bubble plays any indication, though – I think this team is a whole different team in, with you with Yusuf Nurkic out there. He is their difference maker. I expect them to be a playoff team, but probably in the sixth to eighth seed range because the Western Conference is just so loaded with talent. You know, they could creep their way up to a four or five seed potentially just because they've improved. They've filled, they filled holes that were big holes, um, but I, I don't see them being a serious contender. I'm just curious. If you took – if you could rather have a team, uh, Blazers or Jazz, who do you think finishes better? Blazers. I, th- I think the Blazers will be better. Um, the Jazz probably have bigger names, uh, but I think the Blazers, like like we saw in the bowl last year, man, they can compete with anybody if you if Yusuf Nurkic is out there. And Damian Lillard is, uh, I think, a big-time player. He wants the spotlight. He wants – the attention he wants the ball in his hands in big situations cj mccollum let's not forget about him either he is a great second option to damian Lillard. they love playing together and robert covington while they give a lot is a huge addition for them and you know i can't hammer this home enough use of nurkic is their difference maker and he they are such a better team they were not an eight seed last year with use of nurkic they didn't look like an eight seed at all so I, I i think that alone makes them a better team than utah yeah, I, I actually agree with a lot you're saying. Nurkic just adds a whole other element. They didn't have a big man who can really get down there and score in the low post, uh, but also a very good passer as well and improved that three-point shot. He could not shoot a lick when he entered the NBA. He was so yep. rough, but he lost a ton of weight, got in better shape. It was awful, that injury he had, but I'm glad that he came back, um, had a full, really a full season to recover, and I, I, I think he does definitely make this team a whole lot better. I think that they're a really deep team. I think Gary Trent Jr. could be – in the running for six man of the year this year um, because he can just really, really score. We'll see Anthony Simon takes a step forward. They're about 10, 11 guys deep, Matt. And that's why I am, I am actually very confident. I think this is one of the more well-rounded Blazers teams we've seen in a while. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, we can, we can hammer home the Robert Covington point as much as we want to, because he really, like, as we said, we really feel the need, but I also like the move of bringing back Ennis Cantor because he was really good in that half season that he played there. I guess a season ago now when they made the Western Conference Finals, he was a key contributor for them when Yusuf Nurkic was out because that's when Nurkic is out, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he was, he was a huge contributor for them. He was a great offense. He's a great offensive center. You know what you're going to get out of him, but he's a defensive liability. And I think that's where kind of Nurkic stacks up better. Um, you know, Nurkic isn't a great defender, but he's better than Ennis Cantor. And I think he, he's a decent enough defender as a center that he can get the job done. Well, they also have Zach Collins there too, who is who's known to be a really good shot blocker. So they they have all three of those. They can throw out whichever big they want out there. And Zach yeah. Collins and Nurkic started together, so they can play mm-hmm. them both together because both of them can shoot the ball. So I am I am excited to see how this Blazers team is. I I, I am I am higher on them. I feel like than some other people are. But and also, let's not forget Carmelo Anthony is back. Do you think he starts, or do you think he's willing to come off the bench for that team? Man, I, I think the question would be him or, or Collins, which one you start. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think Mel is going to want to start. Um, Obviously. Maybe you just want to keep him happy and, and just start him. I, I think he does fit better in that starting role. I'll say that than coming yeah. off the bench. And maybe Zach Collins because he can kind of fill in either for Mello or Nurkic when they sub in. Okay. So I'm I'm a, I'm a stick also too when you kind of think about it, like if you have if you're giving Ennis Canto legit minutes like you want him and Melo to be your four or five guys on defense I don't think so so I I would rather I feel a little more comfortable with Collins out there okay that's a good answer yeah uh, but let's talk about the Timberwolves this is a team that got a lot better I would say apparently only two players remain from the 2018 roster that's Carl Anthony Towns and Josh Okogie uh, so Gerson Rosas came in right away and was like. Yeah, we're gonna you know clean up shop here because this this roster is doo doo. So we're gonna you know they they had three first round picks. They of course took Anthony Edwards number one overall, Leandro Bomaro, and Jaden McDaniel's also in the first round. Uh, they also signed Ashton Hagens, uh, undrafted rookie. They apparently signed Rondé Hollis Jefferson too. That's a report. Ricky Rubio they bring back to Minnesota, the team that originally drafted him. They also get Ed Davis back. Uh, James Johnson really the only kind of significant loss that they had. 
Uh, so a very, very different team this season. Um, but uh, looking at some of the moves, they also re-signed Malik Beasley as well uh, to a four-year, $60 million contract. We'll get into that a little bit later. But what do you think about the moves that the, the Timberwolves made? They were one of the worst teams in the league last year. Uh, how much more progress do you think they can make this season? Well, let's not forget either that D'Angelo Russell is a huge addition for them as well. You know, obviously this was an addition last season at the trade deadline, but he really only got a month or two of playing with his team before the NBA shutdown. And I really liked watching him with the Wolves. And I think that him and Cat are a great pairing. So I, I think what I expect from Minnesota this season is, you know, in order for this season to be considered successful for them, they need to have some serious improvement on defense. That's first and foremost. With that, I think you will see this team kind of surprise some people and remain competitive for that play-in tournament throughout the year, but only if they improve on defense. Yeah, I like – they're a weird team, the Timberwolves, because uh, I do not trust their defense at all. They are probably one of the worst defensive teams in the league. Uh, but I, I feel like they could low-key make a run at the playoffs. I'm not picking them to be in the playoffs, so I, I want to make that clear. Well, but that play-in like tournament, team- Hunter – it's a yeah. big deal because it's seven, eight, nine, ten. All those seeds are gonna have a chance. I think they could at least be in that. They could. I mean, you look at this team offensively though. Like Carnegie Towns is like one of the best offensive players in basketball. Period. Mm-hmm. D'Angelo Russell, very crafty scorer and passer. We know about that. If Anthony Edwards is a lot better than what people think, if Jared Culver can improve his offensive game, uh, they have Malik Beasley who averaged over twenty a game in fourteen games with them. I mean, offensively, they're going to be a problem. Uh, it's, if they can bring in a couple of defensive guys, I think Rookie Rubio, great locker room guy as well, and you don't lose that playmaking when Russell steps off the court. I mean, you may have to watch out because uh, they, they they definitely got some guys there that can really, you know, cause some noise. And you kind of wonder, like, you know, how how, how motivated is Carl Anthony Towns? He hasn't played in so long. And given all the losses he's had recently in his family, like, right. you know, does he come in extra motivated? Does he come in, like, you know, because when he started last season, for the first three weeks of the league, we're like, this guy might be the MVP of the league right now. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I think, you know, we're so used to seeing bad Timberwolves teams that it's just kind of accustomed to the NBA at this point, where it's just like a given the Timberwolves being bad. But this team, they might not be great, but they're not going to be the usual bad Timberwolves. They're going to be competitive, I think. Like you said, Cat is one of the best natural scorers in the game down low. Uh, D'Lo is a very, I still think, very underrated scorer. He can shoot the three lights out. He's improved his passing ability a lot. If he can improve on defense, which is not a given, he'll he'll be much better. Uh, I, I, this is going to be kind of a low key, entertaining team to watch. Much like you know, a team like the Charlotte Hornets last year, who weren't necessarily good, but they were a fun team to watch. So I, I, I think the Timberwolves can find a fit into that mold too, and especially with knowing that there, you just have to be in the top 10 in the West to have a shot at the playoffs. Just knowing that it's going to make them so much more competitive, and I think it's going to make the league as a whole a lot more competitive as well. Yeah, and also, too, I mean, every year there is a, a couple teams, one or two teams that just absolutely shock you. You're like, I no one said this team was going to make the playoffs. Like the Thunder were that team last year. Yep, no one, the Thunder, yep. No one was like the Thunder are going to be in the playoffs. No one was saying that, and they, they made the playoffs. I don't know. I mean, it seems like no one's really talking about the Timberwolves like that. I don't know that. I think if you're going to tell me one team that no one's saying that could do it, I think it's them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, like I said, with the top 10 teams, dude, the, there's competitiveness going to be off the charts. Yeah. So I think they're really interesting here, but uh, yeah, Malik Beasley, uh, interesting signing four years, $60 million um, secured the bag and secured Laura Parson as Laura, Larsa Pimpin as well. Uh, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that on Instagram or not. Uh, he, he commented on her, <laughs> her post saying, uh, I just want you to be my queen. And then sure oh. enough, signs contract oh and, and, you know, gets his queen allegedly. Yep. So, <laughs> um, but it's a talented team here. Um, interesting group of people they got. Uh, do you think that that they have some of the key foundations for a championship, or like in terms of Towns, Russell, Beasley, Anthony Edwards, or do you think that do you think that eventually at this peak, this team won't ever amount to that? Well, I, I'd say let's slow our roles here a little bit. We're just talking about them being possibly a top ten team in the West, not a top team in the West. So I'm not saying never. 
um, because they are still very young and can still make, still take some advanced steps toward being elite elite. But as of now, I would say no. Um, they need a legit number three guy. And maybe that is Edwards. Maybe it is. Um, but also they need to get, they need to get better on defense. They, if you can't play defense, it's half the game. If you can't play defense, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. I mean, the best teams in the NBA are the teams that play defense point blank end the period. So yeah, I'm not sure they're ever going to be a championship team. And it's just cause I don't, I don't really know if Towns and Russell are winners and Edwards mm-hmm. too. Uh, and those are your three cornerstone pieces. I'm just not sure. I, I'm not sure if their organization's committed to winning. Gerson Rosas has done a phenomenal job with that team so far, and he's done his best to put him in a situation for the future. Um, I think Ryan Saunders is a pretty solid head coach too there. Um, but we'll see. Uh, but, you know, they definitely have a whole lot of talent, but we'll see if it adds up to anything. Yeah, I'm interested. Uh, they're one of the more intriguing teams in the NBA and for me. Yeah, maybe they're going to be one of those all-league pass teams, you know, team that, you know, they're not going to really win a whole lot, but you can watch them and they're fun. Uh, Amen. Yeah, so that is going to wrap it up here on Ball Don't Lie. Again, episode 30. Shout out to all the ones who have, you know, been here the whole time. Uh, shout out to the people that have hopped on the bandwagon. It's okay if you have. Um, but we're going to be doing these for the next couple of weeks, uh, previewing all the teams. Of course, no team gets left behind here on this podcast. We cover everything and we try to dissect every single possible angle we could with each team in the quickest amount of time possible. That's going to wrap it up. Uh, Be sure to check us out next week too, because we're going to keep that content as we inch toward the start of the NBA season. Thank you for watching this edition of Penn State Sports Night. If you're a fan of our content, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more clips. Also, follow us on Twitter at PSSN TV and on Instagram at PSU Sports Night to keep up with all the action. For all my colleagues, we are Penn State Sports Night.